What made you want to pursue a career in the National Park Service? Well, um, I grew up uh, in uh, rural Virginia, uh, down in the sort of Shenandoah Valley part of Virginia, um, very much uh, in the outdoors. I, I loved uh, to be outside. Um, my dad was, uh, uh, went to a one-room schoolhouse through the third grade. He was illiterate. Um, and, but his goal was that uh, uh, my brother and I would go to, go to college. And uh, so we, we were first generation to go to college in our family. Um, and we both studied biology. Uh, I knew basically nothing about the Park Service uh, <laughs> coming, uh, going through college. <clears throat> but I knew I wanted to do something uh, in the outdoors. I mean, I really wanted to pursue a career uh, related to the outdoors. So, um, uh, right out of college, I, I, uh, I took off uh, and traveled around the West uh, in what would probably be considered now a hippie van. I had long hair and, and a beard. And, <laughs> uh, and um, camped in, in national parks I uh, saw the sort of parks of the West uh, in many ways. I was on the road for, for many months. Uh, came back to Washington, D.C. <clears throat> at the time. And uh, my brother, uh, who was six years older than me, had, uh, had served in Vietnam, had gotten out of the military, and was working for the National Parks Conservation Association, NPCA. And, uh, and uh, he said, you should think about uh, a career in the Park Service, and uh, so he suggested that I consider it. I applied for a seasonal job, and uh, and got on uh, here on the Mall uh, in 1976 in the Bicentennial. Haven't looked back, you know. So prior to becoming the director of the National Park Service, you served as regional director for the Pacific West region, where there's a number of Asian American, um, Native American, and Latino communities, and more. How? Were you able to help the parks in the region serve these many diverse and potential audiences? That's a great question. So I lived in Oakland, uh, the East Bay uh, of San Francisco, and I, I, um, my office was downtown Oakland, and I lived in Pinole. Uh, in your Concord, you'll know where Pinole is. And I took public transportation. I didn't drive. Uh, and what was interesting to me, uh, I mean, it was not like a revelation, but it was a, an important factor that every day I got on BART, and as a white male, I was probably in the five percentile in terms of the, the diversity of the community. And then I would get in a car, and I would drive to Yosemite uh, and be in Yosemite Valley and be in the 95 percentile. Yet I was driving across an incredibly diverse Central Valley of California, and I said, so something's wrong here. Um, and so we began to have a lot of dialogue uh, amongst the park organization, our friends groups, our partners about how we can become more relevant uh, to all the citizenry that are within, you know, a short distance. And, and then how can we break down those barriers? I mean, language is one of those and sort of we did exhibits in Spanish at, at Lassen when we redid the visitor center uh, there, but a lot of it was more about uh, really connecting to the kids, you know, how can we reach out? So we were started doing projects with the uh, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce in the Central Valley, um, and and just introducing uh, families to camping, for instance, as an example of, uh, and so even families that had never camped, um, we uh, through uh, donations of camping gear, uh, th the first camping experience we had in the ball fields in Fresno. Uh, literally under the lights of the, uh, because uh, some folks had never slept outside. They had never put up a tent, right? That was the first night, and then we gave them a free entry uh, to Sequoia and Yosemite. Uh, I encouraged the park superintendents to reach out to these communities and work directly with, with uh, community leaders. Uh. Um, so what do you believe that the National Park Service, green groups, and public land management agencies have to gain? by allowing more accessibility and diversity at not only on the ground, but at the administrative level? Well, I think um, in terms of, I never look at this uh, quite like it's about us. Uh, it's, not really, it's not really parochial to me that we're to gain, other than I think that we might pique the interest of, 
of some fantastic young person who wants to come work for us. Uh, and, you know, and that is fantastic. And we, we love to have new employees and we want our workforce to reflect the diversity of the nation. And I think that gives us strength and, and expands our horizons and helps us uh, better serve the American people. Um, I think it's more about our role in, in serving uh, the public, uh, is the way I view it, is that we're not doing our job. Uh, uh, we are not achieving our mission um, unless we are relevant uh, to the American people, to, to each and every individual in America. And that if, if, if we're not helping you discover who you are, what your story is, what your experience was, if we're not reflecting that in the National Park Service, then we're not, we're not relevant. Because the Congress and the President over our history has bestowed on us this responsibility to, to care for places like Manzanar or the Ebenezer Baptist Church or Selma to Montgomery uh, or Cesar Chavez, uh, you know, we have an inherent responsibility to utilize these places and the stewardship of them to, to help the country uh, you know, live up to its, uh, its ideals. We have these ideals that were built upon the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. And obviously, as a country, we are not there yet. Um, and, uh, but we are striving to get to that. So the National Park Service does a great job of recruiting a diverse pool of youth for internship positions and seasonal positions. For example, this Latino Heritage Internship Program focuses specifically on recruiting Latino youth. So what is the Park Service doing to recruit and, and retain this, these youth for permanent positions within the Park Service? That's a great question. So um, <clears throat> I think the first step, uh, like this program and other programs that we're, we're doing, is to introduce you to the variety of opportunities there are. I think that the perception about the Park Service is that if you, you want to join the Park Service, you're going to wind up being on a horse someplace in the middle of nowhere. Uh, you know, and, and yet, you know, just at the example around this table that you can work on the National Register Program, you can work on Historic American Building Survey, uh, you can work in an urban park, you can work, you, and you can, you can also ride a horse in the middle of nowhere, uh, you know, if that's really what you want to do. Um, and so that's the first step, so that you can see that there is a path, perhaps for you and your interest, within the National Park Service. That's step one. Well, those of you that do want to stay, um, you know, we've really tasked our Human Resources Division, uh, working with George, to create a path that you can follow, uh, that we can help, and, and I'll be blunt about it, it's not easy, it's complicated. Yeah. Uh, and the, 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 the complicated component of it is that you know, we're part of the federal government and we don't get to write the rules. The rules for entry into the federal government are written for the entire federal government out of the Office of Personnel Management. We have professionals that help you navigate that. The ELFI program is an interesting initiative what is the future plan for programs like this one? And are these meant to be pathways to career service? Um, well, I, I hope, uh, you know, it's been our intent from day one uh, to expand these programs. Um, unfortunately, Congress really hasn't been very generous uh, with us uh, about, I mean, these programs cost money. Uh, and the Park Service has an appropriation uh, that um, allows us to do some, uh, certainly not at the level I would like, and we've been asking for initiatives uh, and funding through the Congress to support these kinds of programs. Philanthropy is, a, is a, absolutely another option for us to support these kinds of programs, and so we are out working with the National Park Foundation and our other friends groups, uh, Greening Youth Foundation, uh, the Core Network, others to help us fund these kinds of programs so that um, so obviously our goal is to grow them uh, and, and grow them and sustain them so that each year there is an opportunity uh, for the next generation, the next uh, group of youth to, uh, uh, to engage uh, with this. So, I mean, uh, and, and, and George again and his team have been expanding 
more and more of these programs that are that are targeted uh, and uh, well designed so that you know they're not haphazard. There really is a, a, a strong learning component, a, a broad experience. You uh, become a cohort. You get to know each other. You're sharing experiences. You become friends. You're going to be self-supporting when you're out there. You know, doing something that that uh, you're unfamiliar with or uncomfortable with and that, that you can t have somebody to talk to. All of that is really critical to these programs being successful. Um, so uh, I think we're on a good path here, but I'd love to see millions and millions of more dollars poured into this kind of work because I think it's incredibly important. Okay, Director Jarvis, in hopes that America's youth may one day participate in drafting a National Register of Historic Places nomination, be inspired to visit a National Register listing near them, or in establishing greater advocacy for the National Register from a younger age, and hopefully retaining that advocacy as they get older, in what ways do you think the National Register can incorporate and integrate younger and more diverse audiences? So, well, by you being involved, I think it's one of them. Um, so, um, you know, you probably know, we've launched a series of theme studies um, that, that I've been working with our Cultural Resources Division, the American Latino Heritage, uh, Asian American Pacific Islander, um, women, and LGBT. Uh, all are underway um, at various levels. The, we sort of pioneered the American Latino Heritage one uh, with sort of our our model, that which we've learned a lot from, and we've built new ones, uh, the new ones that we've launched, uh, where we bring a group of scholars together. We task them to, to uh, write a piece uh, of story uh, about the history, in, in the case of American Latino heritage, everything from immigration, relations to Cuba, uh, you know, uh, Hispanics serving in the Civil War, I mean, just civil rights, you name it. We're not afraid, you know. So, the product that we expect is not just the theme study, but then is to generate nominations for the National Register program. And we've uh, set aside um, funding and we are put it out to the states uh, uh, through the State Historic Preservation Offices with specific direction that this funding is to be used to develop nominations uh, for new sites that represent the contributions of minorities and women. And in some cases we've been working with colleges and universities to have students write the nominations. Uh, and if you think about how powerful that could be for a young person to actually uh, have a place within their own community that is important and representative, uh, and, uh, and then to carry that through nomination and through designation, uh, it, it would be a very powerful thing, I think, for the individual and for the community as well. And, so um, Big Bend National Park shares 188 miles with the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, there was an NPR story that aired on June 16, 2010, and it stated uh, the possibilities of creating Big Bend into a binational park with um, Mexico. So similar to the park that's in, in the Montana-Alberta border, the Waterton Glacier International Peace Park. And my question is, does the National Park Service endorse this idea? And if they do, um, what would the international context of the park entail for the cultural and natural resource. So one of our efforts uh, when I came on as, uh, as the director and with Ken Salazar as the secretary is to reopen the Boquillas Crossing. And that is, by the way, if you don't know, it is reopened. We haven't played it up really big, but you today you can do what uh, you could have done prior to 9-11 is we have a um, contact station uh, run by the park rangers, not by Border Patrol. Uh, um, it's very high-tech, uh, so you go, uh, there's a video screen uh, where you actually can talk to uh, the Border Patrol. Uh, they'll grant you uh, a pass and then you can go down to the river and cross into Boquillas and vice versa. Uh, there's another contact station on the other side. So we have reopened that and the goal was to really re-engage the potential for an international peace park. Uh, on the Boquillas, uh, at the Boquillas and Del Carmen area. This is, you know, for us, uh, these border parks uh, are incredibly important ecologically. They're also good uh, soft diplomacy. They ignore the issues of, of immigration. We want 
to be able to move more freely back and forth like we do at, at, uh, at uh, Glacier and, uh, and the International Peace Park there. So I think the best shot we have on the, on the Mexico border is, uh, is with uh, Big Bend and, uh, and Rio Bravo. So you re recently launched the Find Your Park Public Awareness Campaign for the centennial of the National Park Service, and it includes a Spanish language website, television, and a radio, PSAs, and print advertisements. Why was this important, and what impact has it had, or do you think it will have? So, um, <clears throat> when I uh, I came on as the director, um, I felt that we really the Park Service needed to um, reach out uh, in a way that we probably hadn't done in decades uh, to connect to the next generation, to really um, speak I I in social media and traditional media and with uh, celebrities and sports figures and, and uh, multimedia to, uh, to your generation. We did a broad, uh, they did what's called a blography, uh, which is kind of the modern version of a focus group. And so very diverse uh, target market, 18 to 35. Uh, and what we measured was what resonates with you when we talk about parks and the outdoors or history or conservation or preservation or engagement and relevancy and story and all that stuff, what works? And, and then we would test like, well, did you know the Park Service does this kind of stuff, that we do preserve these places that are relevant to uh, Hispanic history in the nation, that kind of thing, and they were like, "Oh no, I didn't know that." Did you know that we are, we did, you know, eleven thousand low-income housing units last year? Park Service, we do it through historic preservation tax credit kinds of things. Oh, I didn't know that. Did you know that we're actually in your neighborhood? You know, the park across the street actually probably was a grant from the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Those kinds of things, people don't know. Uh, so, what role do you think the National Park Service plays in telling the story of America? And you think it's living up to that role, and uh, for uh, living up to that role for people of color? Um, I don't think we're there yet, uh, but I do think we have, uh, as I indicated a few minutes ago, a really important role. So I'll give you an example of sort of how uh, something we did recently that I think was uh, was a good example of how we take on that responsibility. So. A few months ago was the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights March at Selma to Montgomery, right? Uh, we brought high school students uh, from across the country, uh, from Little Rock Central High, very important, obviously, uh, site and story that we manage. It's a national park, but it's an active high school uh, and very important in terms of racial segregation uh, in this nation. Um, we brought kids from Ferguson, Missouri from the high schools where obviously there have been recent uh, incidents with the police uh, and uh, the shooting in Ferguson. So we brought young people uh, from Ferguson. Uh, and then we took them to Selma. Uh, they stopped by the Frederick Douglass home. They stopped by, by Petersburg Battlefield, which is part of the Civil War and uh, uh, sites. And then they marched uh, each day uh, about six to eight miles from Selma to Montgomery. Uh, and uh, together uh, with adults and some of the uh, veterans of the, of the original uh, Selma to Montgomery March. The point I'm trying to make is that we take what was a historical fact and event and we bring it right into contemporary issues. And so even what happened in the last uh, 24 hours in Charleston, South Carolina, the AME Church there is a National Historic Landmark. I have employees that are, that are church members we're issuing a statement on that today. So I think that we have uh, a very important role here. I don't think we're quite there yet. I think that uh, we set the goal for the, uh, for the, the Civil War uh, to, to be blunt about it, to rewrite history. The Civil War in this nation has been characterized uh, essentially as a you know, war of northern aggression or states' rights. Uh, you know, all of that, but it's not. It was about slavery. Uh, that's what it, that was the cause of the war. Uh, it was, uh, it, it nearly divided the country, uh, and we set out to prove that uh, as, the, as we went through the 150th anniversary of the, uh, or commemoration of the Civil War, and I think, I think actually we've been pretty successful 
uh, at reframing the way this country talks about the Civil War um, as, uh, and, and still uh, uh, dealing with issues of race in this nation. So I think that it's, uh, that's our job. Did we do all the questions? Did we miss anybody? Thank you. No, no, really, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Greg.